Hello, welcome to Brooklands. Uh, my name is Gareth Tarr and this is Brooklands Members TV. We're here today to talk about this car, uh, the X Rob Walker Delahaye 135CS. <laughs> This is a car with quite a colourful history, uh, raced here by a Siamese prince, uh, also by Rob Walker, a member of the uh, Johnny Walker family, the, the whiskey family. Um, it uh, was built really um, because the French wanted to snub the uh, German uh, um, domination of Grand Prix racing. It was most notorious um, event was probably when it was uh, involved in a, um, a scam to smuggle 3,000 watches into the country in a false fuel tank. Um, it's in a, it features in a film, a promotional film with Jude Law and a couple of world champions. She hasn't run in 40 years. <sighs> My prized possession. The Delahaye 135. Rarer than rarer. I want this car. Ooh. And various other stories. He, he uh, was involved in a very unusual race here in 1939 to determine which was the fastest road car in Britain. So lots of stories to tell. So I guess the first place to start is who are or who were Delahaye? Because um, you know it's a mark that hasn't been around for nearly 70 years. Um, most of you, many of you won't have heard of uh, Delahaye. Uh, well, Emile Dem Delahaye had a business in Tour, um, making machinery for the ceramics industry, I believe, um, in the late 19th century. Now, Tour is about 125 miles southwest of Paris in the Loire Valley, if you don't know where it is. Um, and they were involved in making internal combustion engines. So he naturally sort of progressed to making cars. His first car was made in 1894, which was pretty early when you consider that, uh, most people consider that Carl Benz's 1885 car was the first car. So within 10 years, Emile Delahaye has made his first car. Um, and I think we've got a picture of it actually in here. Um, so uh, there it is. The very first Delahaye car. Um, he um, realised he, he uh, needed a bit more capital and, and wanted to expand the car business and he got a couple of investors involved and the car business moved to a suburb of Paris uh, and actually fairly quickly uh, Emile Delahaye uh, disappeared from the scene and actually he wasn't that well and he died in 1905. Um, the investors had, in, uh, had brought in as managing director a guy called Charles Wiffenbach who was an Al from Alsace uh, and Wiffenbach was involved in the company right the way through then till the 1950s. Uh, he was the managing director. Um, so the car, the, the, the company, the Delahaye, you know, making cars in the before in the pre-war period built up a good reputation for solid dependable cars and then during the first world war they made trucks for the french motor in this uh, for the french army uh, i'm not sure whether they already made trucks they probably did they certainly made trucks for pretty much all the period um, after the war in the 20s they built up a reputation for being solid and dependable what you might call middle class bourgeois uh, transport but not necessarily very exciting I, I mean I, I guess the more modern day equivalent not perhaps today but if you're old enough to remember the 60s 70s 80s it's probably the same image that Volvo had at that time um, but they needed to change that uh, Ettore Bugatti at the Paris Motor Show apparently said to Monsieur Charles if you keep making these type of cars you'll not be in business much longer and they made a determined effort to change um, change direction at that stage um, and a new car came in in the uh, I think about 33 
called a superlux, if I'm right. But they certainly changed direction. Um, at this point on the scene comes the uh, uh, rich American pair, uh, Lo uh, Lucy and Lauren, uh, Laurie Shell. Now you might know the name Shell because their son Harry Shell raced in the 1950s. But Lucy and Lauren, Laura, Laurie, sorry, excuse me, Laurie, um, very much got involved in Delahay and they were very wealthy. Her father uh, was uh, an Irish guy who'd gone over to the States and made a lot of money out of property and other businesses. And she was due to inherit this and I think she did in the mid-30s. And they got involved in Delahay. Um, they were already involved in motor racing and rallying. She did quite a bit of rallying. Um, and so they sort of pushed Delahaye to um, improve their uh, performance and start producing performance cars. Now, the key change was the 1935 Paris Motor Show, where the 135 model was launched. Now, this car we see here is the competition version of that. This is a 135 CS, Competition Special, or maybe Competition Sport. I've seen different names for it, but a CS anyway. Um, but this is a very special version of it. The road car um, was also very successful, and it sort of coincided with the boom in um, French coach building, which was rather flamboyant. And for example, this book, here, which is a French book, and is all about the Delahaye 135. As you can see, very glamorous lady, Paris fashions, and this glorious two-tone um, car with wonderful bodywork. Um, very much what they did, and um, the famous coach builders, and uh, if I can find one, I thought I had it. Maybe not, but the famous ones really were uh, Figoni and Falaschi ones. I mean, here's some examples of some of the types of cars that were done. So the 135 was quite a successful model and it, it, derivatives of it. Um, but Delahaye, obviously in the Second World War, they're a Paris-based company. The Germans occupied Paris, so the company was dead in the war. Um, after the war, like many companies, they struggled, uh, particularly in France, where there was heavy taxation on luxury cars. And you'll find that um, pretty much all the French luxury car makers disappeared in the mid 50s. Uh, Delahaye, which by then was already owned Delage, um, got absorbed by Hotchkiss in uh, 1954, and uh, was then itself. Uh, Hotchkiss itself was taken over by a company called Brandt, so the name disappeared. Uh, so that was the end of Delahaye. So, brief history of Delahaye. So let's start on the story of this car. Um, this is one of, question mark, I'm, I'm led to believe 16 of these cars. Um, one of the frustrations when you try and re research historic vehicles, I, I, I've got books here, and they contradict each other. Um, I think the, the, the definitive number I've been given by Robbie Walker, who owns the car, is 16. And I've certainly seen it says 16 in the, the, the Delahaye book here. Uh, but one of the other books says 15 plus two factory cars. Another book I read said 14. What we do know is there weren't many. Um, and again, this particular car was brought um, over to this country to run in the TT race at the end of 1936. Look, the cars were built in 1936. Um, and I've seen one story that says it's a factory car. I've seen another story that says it was bought off a, a French banker who'd bought three of them. Either way, this car was definitely the one that was raced in the TT uh, in 1936. The following season, it was bought by the White Mouse Garage. Now, the White Mouse Garage was um, the enterprise of uh, two Siamese princes, Prince Chula and Prince Bira, and uh, who were quite famous Brooklyn's racers, of course. Um, many of you have heard those names. Uh, and P Prince Bira raced this in 1937. He won a race at Donington, um, and he actually 
raced in the Brooklyn's 500 that year here. He was supposed to race his ERA, I believe, but that wasn't um, quite ready to be driven at that stage. There was a problem with it or something. Uh, so he raced this, which I think ran in the slightly different class. So th th it was originally the Brooklyn's 500 miles race, but they changed it. And I think it was actually only 500 kilometers. But they also handicapped it. So I think single-seaters had to do the full distance. Sports cars had to do a shorter distance, so maybe it, that helped it. But it finished seventh in the hands of Prince Birra here in 1937 uh, and was raced in various other things. 38, it, uh, by 38, the white mouse garage had sold it on and it ended up in the hands of a, a, a chap called Count Doric Hayden. He was a, a Russian immigre and he was the UK importer for Delahaye by then. Um, Enter one Rob Walker. So who was Rob Walker? Well, as we already mentioned, he was um, a member of the uh, Johnny Walker whiskey factory family. Um, he'd actually been, his, his father died when he was very young um, and he, his mother remarried, uh, married a guy a bit older than herself, who was the actual, He'd been secretary of the MCC, the Marlebone Cricket Club, uh, that owns Lords, for 19 years. Um, but when he married Rob's mother, they, uh, and Rob had a brother, I think an older brother, a couple of years older, um, he, they bought a place called Sutton Venny, which uh, was a, a stately home uh, near um, Froome in Somerset. So. Rob Walker was brought up in, if you like, Downton Abbey, very much that kind of existence. Um, his mother bought them, a, I think it was a Morris, Morris, a bullnose Morris, an old car anyway, um, to drive around the estate for a bit of fun. And uh, the, 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 the house actually had a, a mile long drive. So Rob's favorite trick was to try and race up the drive as quickly as he could and keep breaking his record. So he had an interest in cars from an early age. So, come late 1938, he's a, an undergraduate at Cambridge. He's playing truant to London for a party or whatever. Walking down Park Lane, he walks past this garage and sees this wonderful blue French racing car, which he knew what it was. Hmm, that looks nice. Went inside, how much? 400 pounds. Ah. His allowance from the family was around 350 pounds per annum. So a little bit of a financial dilemma. The salesman says, would sir consider higher purchase? Now, Rob Walker had never heard of higher purchase, but once it's been explained to him and that it only required a couple of signatures, needless to say, it wasn't long before the Delahaye was owned by Mr. R. Walker. I drove it back to Cambridge and had some fun. And his intention was to race in the 1939 season. Um, obviously race here. Now I think uh, we mentioned Count uh, Doric Hayden. He plays a part in, in this pre-war uh, season. And I think it was something to do, I don't know if it was to do with the fact that Walker had bought the car on higher purchase or whether it, there, there was also a thing that Rob Walker couldn't afford the five uh, guineas um, license or whatever but Hayden ended up being the entrant for the car uh, certainly in the race we're going to talk about and uh, Le Mans and was involved in the car for quite a while um, so uh, Rob Walker obviously intends to race here at Brooklyn's where all proper gentlemen did but to do that he needed to get a license um, and now a license to race here meant doing five laps of the track observed by a couple of members 
who would then sign the forms and hopefully you'd get accepted. So on the chosen day, Rob Walker approaches Charles Brackenborough and his friends uh, who are in the bar, uh, known as fairly serious drinkers. And uh, so they're deep in conversation and Charles Brackenborough is yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you do your five laps, we'll go out and observe it and all the rest of it. Now, they could have gone to the tower, the top of the tower on the clubhouse and would have seen his laps. Anyway, so Walker goes out, does his five laps. He actually spun the car on the fourth. So he gets back to, um, back to the bar, two gentlemen still there. Uh, in rather sheepishly sort of said, uh, was that all right? Oh, absolutely perfect, old boy. The two guys had never moved, you know, they sat there, Charlie, signed his forms, and away he goes. Uh, so he started racing here. He, 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 he was lucky to keep his license, really. He, one of the races, I think only a second race, was on, I think, the mountain circuit. There were variations of the Brooklyn circuit by then. And that involved uh, coming down the, so you'd go round the banking um, and in a clockwise direction, and then he'd come, you, you come down to where the fork was, and the Vickers factory on the outside, and effectively do a U-turn to come back up the finishing straight. Um, and it was a handicap race, which he, he obviously got a fairly generous handicap somehow. Um, and he basically needed to overtake the car in front, and away he goes, finishes first. He overdid it a bit, spanned the car, and he ends up up a bank. Now, the car was fitted with a manual gearbox, and you could put a little screw into the gate, which would stop you selecting reverse by mistake. Fine, except now he's stuck up a bank and he can't go backwards. So the only way to get out of it was to bring the car forward and rock it, roll it back and forth, which he did, and roll back onto the track. This was observed by the stewards and not very, uh, not seen as very safe. Uh, but he did finish third. Gets dragged beef, uh, in front of the chief stewards, Earl Howe and um, I think it was George Easton. Um, who had a real go at him and he said, well, you know, and he explained the problem with the gearbox and, he, and they said, well, you know, it, it was a silly thing to do, you know, you, know, you weren't placed, you, you had no chance of doing anything. He said, well, actually, I finished third. Oh, uh, uh, okay. And he basically got a severe ticking off and got put in the black book. And if you put it in the black book, any further misdemeanors and you lost your license. So, so anyway, he, he got the... Um, he, 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 he maintained his uh, license, but by the skin of his teeth. So our next part of the story, it's still 1939. Um, this story really starts um, with this guy, John Dugdale. John Dugdale uh, was born here in Weybridge, visited the track several times, um, and gradually, uh, um, I think he badgered uh, SCH Sammy Davis, who was uh, quite a well-known racer, but also the sports editor of Autocar magazine, and managed to blag himself a job on Autocar magazine as a fairly junior reporter. Now, he got to have a ride in this car here. This, uh, was, uh, this is an Alfa Romeo 2900 B, an 8C 2900B. Now, um, if you're not particularly familiar with where Alfa Romeo were at those time, in the 20s and 30s were the Alfa, Alfa Romeo were the Ferraris of today. Um, and the 29B was basically the ultimate Alfa. Um, if you think, you know, Ferraris occasionally make uh, special limited edition models, perhaps the most recent was the La Ferrari Ferrari. The 29B was the Alfa equivalent, there were only 30 made. It had a, the engine was a two, uh, as, as the name implies, a 2.9 litre, eight cylinder, twin supercharged, um, it, and it was derived from a Grand Prix car detuned obviously for the road car. Now this particular car that this guy Hugh Hunter bought 
was a little bit more special than the average 29B. And they all had these glamorous bodies on. This was the actual car that won the 1938 Mille Miglia. So it was a little bit quicker than the standard car. And to give some idea of how quick this car was, um, at the start of the 38 Mille Miglia, you, you, it started in Brescia, and you, you drive across the flat plains of northern Italy, and the first sort of big city you come to, I guess, is Bologna. In that sort of first hour, um, uh, the, the Biondetti, who was the uh, Alpha driver, averaged 110 mile an hour. You know, think about that, 1938, 110 mile an hour on public roads, which is sort of shut. <laughs> that is some speed. So this was a very, very fast car. And Dugdale, our, uh, our, our man here, he um, had a ride in this car and was obviously seriously impressed. And he wrote a two-page article for Autocar magazine. And uh, as a result, he, uh, I, I shall read now from, from uh, his quote. This, this book is really a collection of his, rem it, it's called uh, Great Motorsport of the 30s. And really is a, a, a various stories and articles from his experiences. And he wrote a short piece and with the title, in the auto car, um, the fastest road car question mark, concluded with this comment about the Alpha. It must be one of the swiftest cars on the roads of this country. Forest Lysette's eight litre Bentley might challenge it, or a short chassis, chassis 38 2050 horsepower Mercedes Benz, Craig's 4.9 Bugatti, or a good 3.3 or the Maserati Whitney straight had converted for the road use. That did it, this is his remark. A spark had been struck. Another chum of mine, the racing driver Ian Connell, wrote in the next week in the best traditions of an English jewel of honour. John Dugdale, in his interesting article on Hugh Hunter's Alfa Romeo, writes that, writes that he would back it against any other car in the country as the fastest sports car. I am willing to challenge Mr Hunter or any other owner of a fast sports car to say five laps of the Campbell circuit for a wager to be decided upon. Driving the four litre unsupercharged Darak, a Darak was sold, it was a French toll but they were sold here as Daraks. My, my four litre unsupercharged Darak that I am now running on the road. This car carries full touring equipment, including windscreen, hood and headlights, and runs on normal fuel pump. IF Connell, Oxley Hearts. And then there's a brackets. Any acceptance will be forwarded, editor. So obviously the gauntlet's thrown down. More uh, challenges. A Navy Lieutenant, the Lieutenant, sorry. Uh, H.E.R. Torrin from Feltham wrote, I would like to bring to your notice a car of which I am the owner and which I think would have little difficulty in seeing off Mr. Hunter's Alfa Romeo. This was no less than the 1933 Works Team Reserve 3 lease to Maserati with which Nuvolari had won the Belgian Grand Prix that year. In full touring trim, continued the lieutenant, this car did a time lap of Brooklyn's at 124 mile an hour. So this thing's get this story's getting a bit out of hand. Other claims and what have you. And so eventually Bill Boddy, at that time, at, at the youthful editor of the monthly magazine Motorsport, of course many of us have heard of Bill Boddy, who had a lot to do with um, helping preserve this place. So Bill Boddy said, um, who had since gone, uh, wrote, the sooner we have a race for such cars, the better. Needless to say, we ended up uh, with a race here. Um, now, Brooklyn's then got involved and the, they offered £50, plus that every driver had to put in three guineas. And uh, Autocar magazine offered a painting from, uh, by Gordon F. Crosby, now, Gordon F. Crosby, um, these are his book, 
this, is, this book has got some of his pictures, was famous really for cutaway drawings, which he did for Autocar magazine. But he also did some fabulous paintings, as you can see here. And I'm sure there's something of Brooklyn's here. There we go. Painting of Brooklyn's. So a Gordon F. Crosby painting was part of the prize. Um, and as an, to give some idea of how, how this thing was being taken, obviously people were making claims, but it was all done very gentlemanly. And um, the uh, clerk of the course here, Percy Brady, invited them all down to Brooklyn's to decide on the rules. And there they are having lunch and deciding on the rules for this great event. Um, so eventually this took place, I think, in about May 1938. Um, uh, actually, this guy, John Dugdale, wasn't there. Um, so I have to sort of turn to um, this book, which actually is uh, by Bill Body. Um, many of you will be familiar with the, the thick Bill Body tome that uh, um, is the story of Brooklyn's. Actually, before, which was published, that, that thick book was published in 1957 um, to celebrate 50 years of the opening of the track. But actually, he'd already written three books, little books, which were, covered different periods. And actually, re if you read these, they're pretty much um, the, the backup, really, the, the start point, really, for the big book. Um, but he says who was driving the cars. Now, the Delahaye... Rob Rolker obviously rather sensibly decided he wasn't capable of driving it to its full ability. And uh, Arthur Dobson, a, a very well-known Brooklyn's racer, was raped in by Count Hayden to drive the car. Uh, the, the other entrants were the Honourable Peter Aitken in Brackenbury's three-litre Delage, R. Dornhoff, I don't know, never heard of that one, in Miss Patton's two-litre Peugeot, Hugh Hunter in the 2.9B Alpha we mentioned, um, Robert Cowell in his, his again, 2.0-litre Alta, Ian Connell in the 3.996cc Derek, nay Talbot, and another, to another Alfa Romeo in the, in the, in the um, they're driven by a guy called G.E. Templar. So the race, it was two races. Um, and some of it was over the Campbell circuit and some was over the mountain circuit. Now, the Delahaye actually set fire <laughs> before the start of one of the races, um, but Dobson managed to get it put out and the car ran OK. The Alfa Romeo won the first race um, with the Delahaye second. And really, the Delahaye, the Alfa and the Talbot were the real, the real contenders, the, the Derek. Um, in the end, the second race, the Hugh Hunter driving the Alpha, and he wasn't really a star driver. He rather fluffed the start, the, car, the car's gears got all mangled up or whatever, uh, with the consequence that the Delahaye won the second race and won overall, and uh, so was the overall winner of the two uh, races. And therefore, this car holds the title of the fastest road car in Britain in 1939, the fastest uh, race spec, road, road, road spec racing car. And this, the cover of the book here by Doug Dale, that is, that is the uh, Gordon Crosby painting that uh, was done to celebrate the event. Uh, again, it's reproduced in this one, which you can see here, perhaps that's better, a better image of it. Um, and I know Rob Walker had that for a long time. I, I, I guess he's probably still in the hands of his son, Robbie Walker. So there we have it. Um, Count Doric, uh, sorry, Count Hayden had um, placed a bet on his, uh, on the Delahaye winning and won enough money that uh, in gentlemanly fashion, 
after the race, uh, sometime after, they had a celebratory dinner at a hotel on the Bath Road near where Heathrow Airport is today. So all very gentlemanly settled. I, 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 I still think that um, probably, um, certainly this guy, John Dugdale, didn't really accept that the Alpha wasn't the fastest car. And, and it does say, he does say here somewhere, you know, it, it, so there was no actual proof that the Alpha wasn't the fastest road car. So it didn't really settle the argument, but it was a fun story. OK, so um, that brings us to Le Mans, of course. Le Mans, 1939. Um, and Rob Walker, great dream, racing the 24 hours, of course. Uh, Count Hayden uh, was the team manager. And uh, it's a sign of how things were done that he ordered a couple of cases of champagne as part of the essential supplies for the, the weekend. And so Rob Walker goes out. He didn't drive the car out, right? I don't think. It was driven out by somebody else. Um, he was a bit concerned because the, um, the practice session, the very first practice session, started at 1 o'clock in the morning, which meant everyone, the first time he drove the Le Mans 24-hour race circuit, was in the dark. So he was a bit concerned about this. Anyway, his um, embarrassment was rather saved by an Englishman called Shrubshaw driving a, a Talbot who um, basically was drunk, very drunk. Um, started touring <laughs> in practice. Um, the marshals worked out what was going on and basically red flagged the race. Shrubshaw was having nothing of, of this. He would paid his money, he was going to drive. And he just kept going round. And they couldn't stop him. At one point, they strung a, the gendarme strung a sort of uh, a barrier across the, the finishing straight and uh, uh, tried to discourage him. But with 200 metres to go, it was obvious he wasn't stopping. And they jumped out of the way. Um, eventually, he, he stopped to see if he'd gone round a corner he think was there. He wasn't sure. He was so drunk. Um, at which point, of course, the gendarmes grabbed him. But it saved Rob Walker's embarrassment because by then it was nearly daylight. So <laughs> practice itself was pretty eventful. Um, come the race, he was sharing the car with Ian Connell. Now, we mentioned Ian Connell before. He was the owner of the Talbot Darak that was raced in the, cha the, cha the challenge, which we talked about just previously. Um, Obviously, a good, competent professional, um, I say professional, he wasn't paid, I, I suspect, but a, a good, competent racing driver um, drove here regularly, it was, was good. Um, and he started the race, uh, which I think would probably start at four o'clock. It was, it, it was the traditional time at one stage for 24 hours. It doesn't always start at four o'clock. Um, so he drove the first four hours or so. So about eight o'clock, Rob Walker is due to take over the car. Uh, so he he's, turns up, gets in the car. Now, eight o'clock was about the time he normally had dinner. So he gets in the car wearing suitable attire, which was a blue pinstripe suit. Racing goggles, not much else. And, but he was driving in some very unusual shoes. I, I don't quite know how these ended up, but they were rope, sh rope soles uh, canvas shoes. Now, quite why he ended up with those, I don't know, um, but they weren't <laughs> to end up pretty much important, as we, we will tell the tale. So there he is, driving around Le Mans in his blue pinstripe suit through to about midnight, I should think, and then um, Connell took back the car, at which point it developed a fault. The exhaust gasket blew, and the consequence of that, I mean, the car was already pretty warm inside the cabin anyway, um, but it, it, it heated up the pedals, so much so that Connell burnt his foot on the accelerator pedal. And when he stopped, he, he was in agony. He couldn't drive again. So Rob Walker gets back in the car early morning, I don't know what time ever it was, by which time, of course, he's changed into a Prince of Wales check suit, um, much more suitable for driving in the day. Um, and these rope-soled shoes played the part because the mechanics soaked them in water, 
in a bucket of water. Rob Walker gets in the car and you can just about bear driving the car um, till the next pit stop and then the same rigmarole puts the suit, they put his feet in a bucket of water, carries on. And he kept going. He, it ends up he, uh, he's got about two hours of the race to go. Gets flagged in by Count Hayden and gets handed a glass of champagne. They were down to the last half bottle and they thought the poor sod that was driving around perhaps deserved a glass. And maybe it perked him up and it took to the end of the race. And he actually finished eighth. So, well, him and Connell finished eighth, which was quite some achievement really, considering he'd driven 16 hours, were pretty much a novice driver, you know. I mean, he'd only been driving at Brooklands for less than half a season. Um, after the race, he went back to his hotel, had a bath, and then jumped in, I think the car, this car, uh, drove to Paris, and him and the British drivers parted till 10 a.m. in the morning. So he was up for something like 48 hours. Now, uh, it's sort of understood that he did get to bed for about an hour, but he probably didn't do much sleeping. I'll leave you to guess the rest. So that's the story of the car at Le Mans. Um, so that uh, really concludes the first part of our story of this particular car. And I think it's probably an appropriate time to actually talk about the car and how the car came about. Uh, and really, the story starts with um, Grand Prix racing in the 1930s. Um, many of you will know that um, in 1934, Grand Prix racing introduced a 750 kilogram formula. The basic rules, the most important rule, was that the car weighed 350 kilograms, no more than, sorry, 750 kilograms, correction. Um, and it, this coincided with the rise of Nazi Germany, and they saw um, Grand Prix racing as a, a great prestige for the German nation and very much encouraged. Uh, Mercedes and Auto Union, which was an amalgamation of four companies, one of which was today's Audi. Um, these two manufacturers dominated Grand Prix racing. They produced fantastically advanced cars, much, much more, much of a big leap forward. Dominated um, motor racing. Occasionally, somebody might upset them. Famously, Nouvellari won the 1935 Grand for a German Grand Prix, much to their annoyance, um, in an Alfa Romeo. But basically, they trounced everybody. Um, and in fact, the 1935 French Grand Prix was a was a humiliation for the French. Uh, and, and the French were proud of their Grand Prix. The first Grand Prix was French. Uh, the 1906 Grand Prix at, uh, it was near Le Mans. Um, and in fact, the first Grand Prix after the First World War was the French Grand Prix in 1921. And it was the only Grand Prix in 21. Um, so for the French to be, you know, th th there, was, there was nothing, you know, they were absolutely slaughtered in the 35 um, French Grand Prix. And as I, just quote Charles Ferroux, who was the, uh, one of the most famous of the French journalists, who, who actually was behind the start of the Le Mans 24 Hours. He described it as la grande misère du sport automobile français. So they were pretty fed up. Um, the French uh, governing body, the ACF, the Automobile Club de France, worked on the principle that if you can't beat them, change the rules. So at the, around the time of the 1935 uh, Paris uh, Motor Show, which was in October that year, they announced that the 1936 French Grand Prix would be for sports cars. Um, part of their argument, a little bit flaky, I suppose, was that the Grand Prix cars were way too advanced. They had nothing to do with road cars. So they bring it back to the true spirit of Grand Prix racing, which really was just an excuse. Um, and this was one of the type of cars that was built to meet those regulations. When they built the regu published the regulations, uh, the cars had to be two seaters. They had to have road trim. Um, now, there was a requirement that a minimum of 20 were built. 
but you didn't have to have 20 built, you could have some under construction. Uh, there wasn't a, I, th I think the engine uh, rules weren't that strict, but it couldn't be supercharged. Um, and the ACO, the Automobile Club de the West, who were behind the um, Le Mans 24 hour race, changed their rules at the time, because they, they required four seaters, but they changed it so that they sort of flexed in with the Automobile Club de France's rules for the French Grand Prix. So a number of French manufacturers came up with suitable cars. This one, we, we did mention the shells beforehand, uh, Lauren, Lauren and Lucy Shell, and um, they basically uh, had a, a sort of encouraged all their motor racing chums in France um, to buy some of these cars. Um, I think I said earlier, it's a question of how many of these were built. Rob Walker said, Ro Robbie Walker says 16, the book there says 16, one book says, that book says, uh, I think it's that one says 14. Another book I read said 15 plus two works cars, but never the 20 that were supposed to be built. But the, the Shells did a lot to encourage people to buy these cars, which enabled Monsieur Charles to afford two works cars. Um, so the car had, it, it wasn't uh, the last word in uh, sophistication of the time. The engine here, uh, obviously, is a 3.6 litre straight six. It was actually a truck engine called a T103. Um, so it was, and it wasn't even a new truck engine. Um, so it wasn't uh, as flashy as some of their uh, uh, competitors, um, but it did have good torque. Um, I've seen figures, again, you, you get varying figures, but I've seen figures, figures between 140 and 160 brake horsepower quoted. Um, but what the car, the car was quite clever in a way. Um, it was uh, designed by a guy called uh, Jacques Francois, I think, who was a uh, Delahaye's de designer. Um, his brief was to use as many uh, standard company um, uh, components as possible, hence the engine wasn't anything other than the development of a truck engine. But the chassis was quite cleverly done. Um, it was light and it handled well for the period. Um, and as I say, there was 14, 15, 16 of these cars laid down. They weren't identical. In fact, no two cars are identical, apparently. Um, just they went to different body people. Uh, Chaperon did some, Figoni Flaski did a few. Um, the works cars were from a coach builder I've never heard of. Um, this sort of double uh, stays is, is fairly standard, although I think there's one that doesn't have that. But I mean, one car was fitted with a, a higher seating position because the gentleman who drove it was a bit on my sort of shape size, a bit plump, and he couldn't sit uh, in a narrow car with the gearbox, so he actually sort of sat above the gearbox. Um, and, uh, but he, d he didn't really consider winning really that important. It was the pay taking part that was important to him. And, and so you'll see different variations. Some had the headlights down here, some had them up there. Most of them had them low down. Um, now the 1936 uh, Le Mans 24 hours was actually cancelled at fairly short notice. There were strikes in France at the time. I mean, in the book here where I said, you know, that the French Grand Prix was uh, in 1935 was pretty much humiliation for the French. Well, it was pretty much the mood in France, which was pretty gloomy at the time. Uh, and as I say, there was national strikes and the French and the Le Mans 24 hour race for 36 was cancelled at very short notice. But two weeks later, they all assembled for the French Grand Prix at Montlhery. And um, that was won by a Bugatti. Um, but this car, these cars, Delahaye's finished second to fifth, I think. Uh, and I think there was quite a number of them in, involved. I think it was about nine of these cars involved. Um, so prove that the car worked pretty well, not quite as fast as the Bugatti, but you know, a very competent car. Uh, and they ran, you know, obviously in various 
guises up until the Second World War. The, a, a sister car to this one, a 135CS, won the 1938 Le Mans 24 hours race. <laughs> B, the star car, in, in, un, interestingly, was uh, the 29B Alfa Romeo, not, not the Hugh uh, Hunter car, which we mentioned earlier, but a sister car. And that particular car, which is a fabulous car, um, you quite often see at Goodwood, or, and it's part of the Alfa Romeo Museum's collection, and you will see it uh, in there. Um, but uh, it was quite, and again, beyond Etty, uh, who, as I say, won the Media Media in the car that was Hugh Hunter's, dr driving the sister car, which was a coupe. Um, but it broke down uh, not that far from the finish. Uh, so the Delahaye won. Um, and as I say, uh, by, by the war, I, I guess it was probably running towards the end of its uh, time. So, um, I mean, uh, if we look round the car, um, so I, I, like, I always love the sort of like leaf types, um, uh, uh, the steering wheel effect which you get on some of these cars. And I love the blue, um, the, the, the tachometer with the blue background. Um, it's, an, it's not, as I said before, the fastest car in its class, but it's actually quite a clever design and it works quite well. Uh, and obviously had a fair amount of success um, in various races. Some of them had this rather unusual sort of teardrop shaped um, rear, wing, rear, rear uh, mudguard effect, which obviously was some attempt at uh, aerodynamics, but they didn't all have, as I say, they were, they were different bodies. Um, I'm not quite sure which car this, this originally was. Um, but a fabulous car. So that's the, the 135 CS. So now we come to the story of the car after the Second World War. Um, during the Second World War, Rob Walker, had uh, he, he flew for the fleet air arm, which was a bit of a surprise thing as he'd already lost his flying license. Uh, he, um, did a bit of a stunt, I, I'm not sure which race course, but he was at a race, race horse meeting. And during the lunch break, he got in a light plane and he, he jumped the jumps and went round the, round the track. <laughs> and uh, the, the um, authorities took a dim view of that and took his flying license off him. But that didn't stop him flying for the, the Navy during the Second World War. Um, he turned up with this car at Portsmouth, I think it was Portsmouth where he, where he signed on, and asked the the, the corporal or whatever, where do I put my car? And got a rather impol impolite reply. So the car actually ended up back at Sutton Venny, the company, the, the family stately home, uh, spent most of the the war in a squash in a squash court there. Post war, um, Rob Walker got married in 1940, and part of his agreement with his wife was that he wouldn't race anymore. He did do sprints and he did hill climbs, but he wasn't doing serious racing. But he would be the entrant of the car. Now, this car took, play, took part in the last Le Mans 24 hour race before the war, and it took part in the first one after the war, which was 1949. Um, one of the two drivers was Tony Rolt. Now, Rolt had already made a little bit of a name for himself here at Brooklyn's racing before the war, uh, as a very, fairly young man by, at that point. Um, during the war, he was part of uh, 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 the defense of Calais as the Germans advanced, fought very bravely, uh, for which he was to receive uh, the military cross. Uh, but he unfortunately got captured by the Germans. He, he, they were trying to hold up the Germans and get the troops off the beaches at Dunkirk, um, but he got captured. Um, but, uh, you know, for you, Tommy, the war is over. Well, not for Tony Rolt. Uh, he escaped from seven prisoners of war camp. So eventually they threw him in Colditz. And uh, he, uh, 
if you follow the story of Colditz, which some of us have, um, of the various schemes to escape from Colditz, one of the more audacious was to build a glider, um, which got built, but the Americans fortunately uh, liberated uh, Colditz Castle before this uh, attempt to fly this glider was was happened. Um, so Tony Rolt, I think he got a bar of military classes because of his attempts to escape during the Second World War, but clearly quite a character. He did go on to win the 1953 Le Mans in a Jaguar C-Type. Now, the other driver was a guy called Guy Jason Henry, who did a deal with Rob Walker to part by the car, and basically he, he had use of the car and he entered it wherever he wanted. Um, ran it, I think, pretty much independent of Rob, or, or I, I'm not quite sure the arrangement. Anyway, Rob Walker sat in his office in, by, by now he's bought Pitbrook Garage in Dorking, he sat in his office one September afternoon, and a friend of his rings up. Hey, have you heard? You know, J Guy Jason Henry, did you hear he's been uh, arrested by the customs at New Haven trying to bring 3,000 watches back in a false fuel tank? Walker says, ah, silly bugger, typical of him. And his friend says, oh yes, by the way, the car was your Delahaye. <laughs> so <laughs> this car goes down in the, uh, uh, is at the centre of this uh, scandal now. Jason Henry was really a bit of a, a fall guy in this, um, and, and clearly the customs had had a tip off, and it wasn't really him that they were after, they were after the Mr. Big, whoever he was. Um, and Jason Henry actually only got fined £25, and that was for actually having a, a, an illegal pistol in the car. I mean, for God's sake, <laughs> you know, I suppose if you're going to break the law, break the law big. Uh, but that left Rob Walker with a dilemma because the car was impounded as part of uh, this, this uh, scam and uh, how to get the car, at, you know, liberate the car. Um, the pressure that was sort of put was what happened with Cunard because obviously every time a Cunard liner came into Southampton or whatever with uh, passengers on board, there'd be a few trying to s smuggle a bit of this and that and the other in. How did they cope with that? They didn't Im impound uh, the Cunard liners. Um, didn't really work. And in the end, Rob Walker had to pay £300, sort of nearly what he paid for the car originally. Originally, he paid three hundred pounds to get it released, um, and he, he in then he sometime after he sold the car on and got sold on again. It ended up in the hands of a rather eccentric Scotsman who modified the the bodywork, and um, it was. Uh, but Rob Walker still wanted to buy the car back at this stage, and in nineteen seventy. He actually, the, the Scotsman had died, and Rob Walker bought the car back at Sotheby's auction for three and a half thousand pounds, nearly ten times what he'd originally paid for the car. So he bought this car three times, uh, had it converted back to its original specification. Uh, which brings me to pretty much the final little anecdote about this car. Um, if you go on YouTube and put in The Gentleman's Wager 2, you will find a little promotional film in which this car features. Now that film uh, is for Johnny Walker Blue Label, surprise, surprise. Uh, it's about 11 minutes long, features Jude Law um, and a guy called uh, Giancarlo Giannini, I think. Um, if you're a Bond film fan and you've seen um, Casino Royale and Quadrasponte, uh, quantum of solace you will have seen him he's the guy called mathis with the beard um so you might recognize him or you might recognize him from uh, other things he's been certainly in plenty of other things um and the story is i, I won't give too much away um but it's about this car go, driving from rome to uh, monaco for the grand prix and uh, can it do it or whatever uh, and jude law drives the car um at one point he stops to help a pretty girl whose classic car's broken down. Um, I, won't, I, I won't tell you whether he gets the girl, but she do, does give him a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label, obviously far more important. Um, so involved in the film are two former Formula One world champions, uh, Jensen Button, 
blink and you'll miss him. He's the guy in the helicopter. Um, and uh, Mika Hakkinen you'll see towards the end of the film. Quite a nice little promotional film. As I say, if you go on YouTube and put in The Gentleman's Wager 2, you'll see it there. Um, and recently it appeared in the um, Yesterday TV series that was uh, filmed here, Secrets of the Transport Museum. You will have seen um, Julian Grimwade, uh, our vice chairman of the members, um, starting this car up and, and messing about with the magneto to get it running. And eventually he runs it and Robbie Walker, the owner of the car, drives it and then Julian drives it. Working on such an historically important vehicle may be a privilege, okay. but it also carries a weight of responsibility. Right, we'll just dry the seat off, ready for Robbie, and I just really hope it starts up okay. Always nervous. Oh, every time I see her, it makes my hair stand up. <laughs> Hello, Robbie. How are you? I'm very well. You Good are to see a saviour. Let's see, and Joey. I can't wait. So, if you want to come round and... Um, your chariot is ready, sir. I'm sure you know how to get into it better than I do, but it's, it's very well, small. It, it is small. I didn't think of opening the door. Even so, it is not easy. Yeah, you're nearly there. Nearly there. Yep. That's it. We're in. The racer may have started for Julian yesterday, but with vintage vehicles, there's no guarantee that that will happen a second time. Just give it a, a push on the, just the starter there, and it should go. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Enjoy it. It looks like the love of speed runs in the Walker family. like a kid with a new toy. It's fabulous. Good to see. Here he comes. Um, one bit I, I, I forgot to tell you about, mention about the infamous uh, 3000 watch scandal. Our chairman here, um, chairman of the members, um, Neil Bailey, in his early career worked for the customs in the southeast. And the story of this car in 1948 and Guy, um, Jason Henry, was still a very well-known story. And Robbie Walker was driving this car back from an event at the mall in, I think, 1979. And he gets off the uh, ferry at New Haven and uh, customers say, excuse me, sir. And they had a bit of a joke about it, but, you know, uh, the, the customs made out that, uh, is there something strange with this car? So it, it really did have a reputation. But just to sum up, I mean, I think it's a lovely looking car. Um, if you're coming to Brooklands, come and have a look at it. Uh, it's, um, you know, has a fabulous history, as we've just described. Uh, and I think you'll find it uh, a very interesting car to look at. Uh, thank you very much.